So today's presenter comes to us with 28 years of experience in local government. He currently serves as the General Services Director for the City of Germantown. He is a TNCP examiner as well as a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt who holds both an MBA and a CPM. Please help me welcome Mr. Reynold D. Douglas. Good evening, good afternoon. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy schedules. First off, give yourselves a hand clap. Well, y'all put in a lot of work today, so folks are tired, so I'll try not to bore you too long. Uh, when I was sitting there listening to the intro, I was wondering who she was talking about. <laughs> but it happened to be me. You probably wonder, how does a government use the tools of Lean Six Sigma? Well, thanks to our good friend, Dr. Fisher, come to the city of Germantown roughly seven, eight years ago and told us that we needed to look at the way we do things differently, to maximize dollars that we have because we try to keep taxes low. We really do. So if we are able to look at ways to maximize the dollars, we keep taxes low, we keep our customers happy, right? That sound reasonable. So we identified through Dr. Fisher who our customers are. We actually have a couple of customer groups, that is the residents here the town, visitors that come through, for whatever reason, and the business community. These are our customers. So in order for us to be able to provide the level of service that's uh, expected, we need a little help. So Dr. Fisher helped us out. I actually went through uh, the Methodist uh, group to get certified for Lean Six Sigma. And I don't know if any of you, how many people in here are Sigma trained or exposed? One, two. So y'all know that it is, it's actually pretty neat. It's more to it than just data. I mean, there's a lot of tools there. So one of the projects we did in the beginning to, I guess, get our feet wet and try to do some internal house cleaning, pun intended, <laughs> we have a central warehouse um, that supplies all of the goods and services that we use, whether it's um, cleaning supplies, uh, water meters, piping, um, fire hydrants, different things that we use throughout the city to provide the service. Well, I've probably seen this on the screen here. When we started this in our fiscal year 11, that's what, eight years ago, that accuracy rate, if y'all can see it, 36%. In the business world, how many of you would still be employed <laughs> <laughs> and, and you were responsible for inventory at 36% accuracy. That's exactly what I thought. None of us would be employed. Now, I'll tell the story as, as we go. Now, we look at the money there. I mean, it's 64% inaccuracy level, and we're looking at only $145,000 that's not a, accounted for. That doesn't sound like a lot of money. And in the grand scheme of a big budget, really it's not, but it's unacceptable, 36% accuracy it just it's not your business so by uh, using the tools we compiled a team and we actually had folks at the top to be our champion we had our subject matter experts but this whole concept of using lean six sigma tools was new to everybody in the organization including us that was going through the program those that have been exposed to lean six sigma and have done projects you have somebody who's, who knows nothing about your area come in and start asking questions. How many of us have experienced that and you think, who is this person asking all these questions? They didn't tell me what to do. <laughs> well, it's not a matter of telling folks what to do. It's, a, it's about trying to find the, out, the, the desired outcome. Of course, in order to do that, you have to come up with a good problem statement. And most of you know that a problem statement needs to have some data in there. What does data do for us? It tells the story. Whether we like it or not, it tells the story. So as we went through the process of getting our problem statement together, and it took a while to get a problem statement nailed down. 
it, it, it took longer than you would think. It's not a matter of sitting down and 30 minutes later you have a problem statement because when you're dealing with data, you got to be able to find the data, right? The system that we had in place, um, we have a, a financial system and it's grown over the years. Now it's called Superion, but it was Navalon, it was HTE, and it's an integrated system. It does the financials, it does warehousing for inventory, it does work orders. It's this robust software that uh, it can be complicated to use. As we were doing our drill downs on this, we, we followed the steps. We came up with a project plan. And we know that there's an acronym for uh, that you use in Lean Six Sigma. It's called DMAG. Everybody, I think y'all may know what that is. Define, measure, analyze, improve, control. Sounds good, right? Mm -hmm. But you need data in order to use DMAG. And I'll get to that in just a little bit. So we had to come up with, we actually had to build this because none of this was in place. Can y'all see okay? okay? Yes, sir. What kind of stuff was in the warehouse? Paper products for cleaning, um, what? Paper towels? Paper towels, cleaning supplies, uh, piping, pipe fitting. Um, Any road construction stuff? Or um, for building maintenance? We had, no, we don't store paint. We actually, you know, because we don't, we don't use enough of it. Uh, utility water meters, um, copper piping, soft copper for emergency repairs that the utility guys use, um, stuff that the sign crew would use. I mean, we're talking stuff automotive for fleet, you know, all the parts and um, brake drums, rotors, pads, belts, you name it, light bulbs, ballast anything you can think of that it would take to make city operation happen, we had it. At least we thought we did. <laughs> uh, as, as we did drill down, I'll say, I'll say. Um, so we, we, we come up with the project plan and in that we found a lot of things were missing. One of the first things that um, we needed to do was Let's do a little flow chart and see what's going on. Well, the flow chart that you see here actually would be the ideal flow chart. Whereas the customer comes in, make the request, they go pull it, enter it into the computer, give it to the customer, the customer does their paperwork, they leave, at the end of the day it's reconciled back. Okay? Yes, sir. Customer is a service person for the Yes, sir. Internal employee. Yes, sir. From various departments, you know, twelve different departments. So, that would be the ideal. Well, they were doing that, but it wasn't ideal. Everything was handwritten. There was no reconciliation. None of that stuff. So, in our side pot, we we identified our, who our supplier, our input, the process, lack thereof, what the output was and our customers. Most of our customers were internal groups. Our departments, 12 different departments. But we do have facilities that are available for rent. You know, you can rent facilities. So we actually had user groups, whether you're renting a facility or if it's one of the sports uh, providers and their teams and families and all this good stuff. And of course, I prefer the word resident rather than citizens because cities are not countries, okay? You're, you're a resident of a city. But anyway, that's a little, a little pet peeve of mine here. But as we did that, we came up with a more detailed process map on what was actually happening. Well, we found out that a good practice was only as good as the person working. That good practice was only as good as the one person that was working and there was two people in the warehouse. No finger pointing because in Sigma we learned to look at the process first, not the person. Right? 
That sounds good. We'll go with that. We'll stick with it. So when we went through that, we actually did a, a fishbone, and we uh, we filled it out, and and it again, this took a lot longer than than we thought it was going to, because we had some things we had to come up with to try and measure because we had no data in the software. Sounds like a train wreck, right? When you That's said no data in the software, does that mean as far as you had no track of what was in inventory? Yep. I mean, the items within the warehouse, there was... We had, we had it, but it was not accurate. Mm -hmm. And when I say it was not accurate, we found that a lot of stuff was obsolete. And uh, inventory was only taken once a year. But you had plenty of the obsolete stuff. Yes, sir. Have y'all heard of GovDeal.com? <laughs> GovDeal.com, uh, yeah, I mean, you can buy a lot of stuff on there. A lot of the stuff was actually uh, written off. Uh, of course, that's a process within itself because of audit purposes. So you have to, in government, you got to cross the T's and dot the I's. But back to this, um, we had to actually go in and, and figure out cycle time for counting. And instead of them doing it like quarterly or reconciling at the end of the day or things that you normally do for inventory, it just simply wasn't happening. They would actually close the warehouse in the end of June because our fiscal year begins July 1. So it would be closed for like two to three days. No activity out of the warehouse. So if you needed, you couldn't get it because they were actually trying to reconcile. And this is over 12 months. Okay. I mean, it, not gonna happen. it's, you're right, <laughs> not going to happen. So each year they would have to um, <clears throat> reconcile financially to make it, make it balance, make it work. With this project, as I mentioned earlier, when you go to someone's area and you start asking questions, they don't want to tell you. They have this idea, you're trying to tell them what to do. Well, we're not, we was not trying to tell them what to do, we were just trying to understand. Just trying to understand. So as we started to collect our data, we found out that in the warehouse, everything that was in the different buildings, as they called it, there were no men's and maxes. How about that? No men's, no maxes, it was just stuff. Uh, yeah, I need this many. Okay, we'll get this many and you use them down. Well, I need such and such. Well, we're out. Just practices, no processes. So after we uh, figured out we had a bigger train wreck than what we thought, we tried to uh, go into our financial system and extract whatever we could for data. Just trying our best. Well, y'all know the story. <laughs> nothing in, <laughs> nothing out, right? That was our story. Did you ever try analyzing the actual paper for us? We did. Nothing in, nothing out? <laughs> nothing out. Okay. Even with the work order system, as folks would come in and get different things that they would need, depending on department or job function, and we would get broke down, but there was no quantities, there was no pricing attached to it. I mean, yeah, you know, this was so kind of serious. So it really could be going to a lot of people's houses and stuff. Right? It could be. <laughs> it, could, it could have been, but we never looked at it that way because the services were being provided. But we just knew that 36% accuracy was not where it needed to be. Just simply not where it is. Well, the real impact is the, the deterioration of service throughout the whole community. Actually, the service level, as far as we know, did not drop. We just did not have accurate inventory. We never thought of folks taking stuff home. We agree with that. It, you just couldn't. You couldn't go into the system and find it, like y'all are familiar with warehousing and inventory. So we uh, we ran different tests. 
and um, there was nothing there. We actually called um, our um, Monty for some help to try to figure this thing out because we're trying to use Domaic. Well, we didn't have data. We didn't have processes. So we wound up using the MADV. We actually came up with the processes and actually built our warehouse system so that it, everything could be accounted for. When we did our process map, y'all y'all see all the blow-ups here. As I mentioned earlier, men's and max were not there. Uh, appeal numbers as they would order stuff that was with the financial system, whenever you order something and you get it in, you have to reconcile in the financial system that the inventory has been received. Then when it goes out, it has to be accounted for and then back into the uh, inventory side, it has to be reconciled. So as you can see, everything was just blew, you know, it's blown up. There was, no, there was nothing there. Kind of made us wonder how other folks were doing it. So, so was he wondering how other people did it? Did you do any benchmarking? We tried benchmarking. We tried that. We actually went to Granger. They said, you know, we figure they're best in class at it. And um, we learned a lot from Granger. As a matter of fact, when we told them what we were doing, Granger said, well, we can run the warehouse. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's not what we were coming here for. We're trying to make things right internally and, and uh, keep everything in house if we can without outsourcing. Um, so yeah, we did do that. We, we did that. Did you benchmark with any other municipalities? We made a couple phone calls. Can I leave it there? No, <laughs> okay. right. um, So. When we did our uh, analysis, as I mentioned earlier, there's no processes. Um, folks are always signing for something, but again, no data provided, none at all. There was no standardized workplace, no, no staging. You know, it hits. It comes from the truck. It hits the shelves. Some of it would get um, inventory numbers. Some of it wouldn't. Just. Stuff. Right. So, I mentioned earlier about PO number. If you look to the right of the screen, 15 days to generate a PO number. Is do y'all think that's acceptable to? And you don't order it until you need it. How about that? So, we found out just by trying to get accuracy level correct that the folks in the warehouse was doing the best that they knew to keep stuff on the shelves. Instead of using a PO number, they would fabricate a PO number to mm -hmm. order and <laughs> back, in back in. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, as y'all all know, that's not, not a good practice. Uh, again, it gets back to folks coming in, asking questions, and folks that are subject matter experts and why are you asking me all these questions you trying to tell me what to do we were just trying to understand for 15 days to generate a PO number I think it ought to be said that generating extra PO numbers to try to keep stuff on the shelf that's just them dealing with the crappy system that's handed correct correct. It's correct kind of courageous in a way you know? it is it, it's you know now if you look at 15 days to generate a, a PO number Ten days before it was actually invoiced and paid, because it's got to come from the supplier of the invoice. So you look at 25 days before the product ever got paid for. Chances are it's already been used, consumed, installed, whatever. How about that? It's kind of neat, huh? That's okay though. We got better. Green sheet. Thank you. Green sheet is. Uh, it's actually it comes. It's 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 a printed form that has the uh, the vendor name, the vendor number, the PO number, the requisition number, the quantity, the description, the unit, and the cost. All the things you need. It's actually four sheets of paper: green, white, 
yellow than gold. <laughs> so each department or each function gets its own color of paper. Let's see. This stuff. So I'm, I'm just confused because if you had an electronic system, why was the paper used? You asked such a good question. Oh, okay. She's <laughs> a it's a and it, it's a really good question because you you would think with an electronic system software system you should be able to just go in and if things are turned on which we found out were not that you could receive things in the system make payment check get cut whatever and go out to the vendor all these things could be done electronically but a lot of the features were not turned on so with this project, we took an onion, a small onion, and it grew overnight. And as we peeled back, it just started spraying and everything else. It got bad. Somebody have a question? Yeah, just, they probably got out of the system at some point in the past, and it was nothing like reality in front of them. So they are screwed that way because they the paper. Do it our own way. How many folks have heard, we've always done it this way? <laughs> oh, that's all right. Well, so-and-so, they know how to do it. Let's get them to do it. Well, they're off work today. We'll wait till they come back. Y'all heard any of this before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we experienced a lot of that. And we tried that, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, tried that, it didn't work. So we, uh, we had some uh, solutions. Can y'all see okay? One of the obsolete, the obsolete items uh, that I'll mention, things that were not being used anymore. We had stuff for vehicles, trucks, that were from the 70s, okay? Torinos. Still in inventory. So, just that. Well, you know, you never know. You never know, you never know what's gonna come through the shop, right? Um, and we had, we had to establish the men's and max. And that's when we got with the different departments and said, okay, if you know how many of, we'll just say widgets that you're using, we can order that. And then at that point, we can monitor and set men's and max for order. So we were able to do that. I'm sorry. So how did budgeting come into this? I mean, budgeting? is one thing and then the SOPs uh, <laughs> this, this is a nightmare to me exactly imagine what we was going through okay no usage numbers somewhere on paper wow. yeah somewhere on paper you ask for it you can get it some of y'all been down this road but it, all in all, it was a fun project. We learned a lot. Um, we, we had no back order policy. If things are on back order, what you do next? It, it was, for y'all, there, y'all are in quality, y'all. We were, we were struggling to try to make this project work, to try to improve it. Um, but we were able to do a lot. Uh, one of the, and Sigma, you're, you're taught that if you have a solution already, you don't have a problem, right? Or if you already have a solution, why go through the process of trying to make it better, right? So we had folks say, well, you know, if we had some really nice shelving, that would make all the difference. Oh, yeah. Any of y'all heard that before? We need nice shelving. You need to cap what you have and make sure you have it. But I'll go on to the next slide. So the list of assets, we did a, a field force analysis and we we said, well, okay, we can do the five S's. Okay. That was first thing. After we identified obsolete stuff, junk. There was things in the warehouse that did not belong in the warehouse. We had storage, things that were used for different events. I mean, so that was one of the things that was part of the five S's that we did. We actually <coughs> made it into a warehouse setting. And uh, the workers in there. The slides, 
What's that? Christmas lights and seasonal Christ Christmas. Yes, yes. Hey, it's a big space. Might as well use it. And for where else is it for? <laughs> yeah, we're not simple inventory, right? right? So we, we did the five the card. And, um, and we tried to standardize some things. And, and the, uh, the run weekly report for minimums was, was a learning curve for the folks in the warehouse because they were not used to using this uh, financial system. So that, that was a whole nother avenue to, to go down. You established uh, standard order quantities too? We did. We did. We did. So it, um, this project, like I said earlier, was kind of like an onion. We started peeling back. And it, it, it got tough enough that we actually started getting pushed back from, um, from some folks that were in support of it in the beginning. Because it, 36%, makes you look really bad, right? So you think, but if you embrace it and say, okay, let's make it better, then they could have looked at it a little different. So anyway, we caught a little flack about it. I'll put that lightly. This layout here is, is actually